Thank you for tuning in to the best parenting show on the internet. Post Daily Dose. Post Institute, this is Christy Saul, the co-founder, coming at you live with another episode of Post Daily Dose, the best little parenting show on the internet. Hope you guys are doing fabulous today. I'm coming on a little bit early. It's Friday. I've got my corporate prayer getting ready to start. And so uh, if you feel a flood of love, it might be. It just might be that you pick up the vibe. Rose Vander Ark, how perfect that I see you watching because I just mentioned that I'm getting ready to walk into corporate prayer. So I'll be thinking about you. And I want to thank you specifically because I know you've told me that the Post Institute is on your list of organizations that you lift prayer for and I really appreciate that so anyway let's just get on with the show today uh happy birthday big papa BP Brian Post sweet B the man has a lot of nicknames <laughs> but happy birthday Brian Brian is the co-founder of the Post Institute we teach a model of parenting that was downloaded to Brian like years and years ago before trauma-informed care was even a term and uh, the concept and principles that he's been teaching that I now have the privilege of teaching have been effective in creating love and healing for many 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 families and many children and it just is a wonderful thing um, <clears throat> as many of you know Brian is also an adoptee um, so I, I sort of feel like there's something really special when we celebrate the birthdays of adoptees, uh, makes me have lots of people. There's a lot of people to thank, right? It increases the circle of love. There's lots of people to thank, lots of appreciation to have. Um, and I'm sure that Brian has been celebrating. It also brings up this very interesting topic about adoption and birthdays and birth and let's see happy birthday mr brian prost grand persona que la van bien en la vida se primo mi amigo did i get that even close to right leonardo you're probably just over there laughing at the fact that i don't speak <laughs> i don't speak spanish <laughs> but thank you so much thank you joni i know brian has appreciated all of the well wishes so as we're celebrating Brian's birthday and we know that the Post Institute, we talk about all things love and we are very pro-family, but we're also super pro-children and understanding the needs of children who come from tough places. Um, so I'll just use today being Brian's birthday as a platform to talk about and advocate for adoptees having access to their birth records. It's really important. There are lots of states do, do, that still have a closed record policy. Um, gosh, when you think about health issues, when you just, just knowing um, in all of my years in working in this field, I have not met a single adoptee who at least at a minimum didn't have a curiosity about their first family. And so um, on this day, as we're celebrating Brian's birthday, uh, when Brian was in his late 30s, I believe it was, was when he was able to access records and gain information about his first family. Um, and so um, I know, I just know that that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And to do anything otherwise, for states to have closed record policies is not a pro-child perspective. And when I say child, we're all children. We all have parents. And so I don't know what age those records should be in the hands of children or people be able to access those. I don't have opinions about all of those ins and outs, but I do know 
that I've never met an, uh, an adoptee who didn't have at a minimum a curiosity of their first family. When we think about health issues, we know that that is super important. It's super important to be able to have that information. And then when we think about our heart issues, our, our soul issues, then, um, yeah, you know, it becomes something that's really important. Joni asked, at what age would you share that info? What if not safe? Well, so, you know, at what age? You know, in our world, we have this rule of adulthood in the legal world as being the age of 18, um, which is interesting because then we have some, some things out there in the world that are like, they don't match up with that, right? So you are considered an adult in the legal system by the age of 18. But then... You can actually attend public schools until the age of 21. And if I'm remembering right, if you are, you are also able to stay on your parents' insurance until age 21. So it kind of makes me wonder if there might not be a shift. And then we also know from the field of neuroscience that there's so much brain development that's still going on in the 20s and that the brain doesn't really finish the pruning process and the development of top-down thinking until the mid to late 20s. So, you know, when, the when, I think that that is, you know, if you were looking at that from like a legal perspective, the law might have a certain age that they would be, uh, that they, you know, that they could legislate those records being accessible. Um <clears throat> So I'm just going to step out and give my opinion. My opinion would be, from a legal perspective, 18 would be the age to legislate that being open if it's not an already open adoption. And I say that because I also know so many adoptees that, um, well, let's just back up. Marcy Axness says, our, brain are, our brains, our mind-body system, our brains are being developed in the womb for the world it will be born to. And so, not all adoptions have the connected, loving relationships that we try to grow as we teach at the Post Institute. And I know many adoptees that when they hit the age of 18, they leave home. And they leave home to a world where they don't have support. And so, there could be benefit. There could actually be benefit to the child in knowing who their first family is. Um, I think about the same thing with regards to foster care. And so just knowing how many foster children end up homeless, knowing how many foster children age out of the foster care system without being connected to their first family and how difficult that makes for those kids it's a really big deal. And so as we are celebrating Brian's birthday, I just want to advocate that as people who are very instrumental in the world of adoption, being adoptive parents, that we understand our kids need to have that information um, and that we be advocates for our children and we stand by them. And I know, you know, I know it can get scary and I've heard some really, you know, stories of, well, if you want to go find them, then I'm going to disown you. And it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. Um, love is a mighty powerful thing. And it, it is, it can be surprisingly beautiful. And that process of allowing and supporting can also give the ability for our children instead of fleeing from us that we can we can guide through all of this like all of it all of you know it, it's not like it has to be us or them it can literally be that process where maybe we meet some amazing people and we just end up creating this great loving village that can happen and it does happen or it can happen where they meet their first family and it is a synchronicity that that person had not had before. And that doesn't mean that as an adoptive parent, you were a bad parent. It doesn't mean anything like that. It's not necessarily about that. And so that can give this human being a connection that for whatever reason,
reason they hadn't experienced before that. And then the next thing that I see sometimes is this, they meet and they know who one another are and then life continues and it's like an aunt, that, like the first family feels more like they're an aunt or an uncle. And so, you know, it's complex, but it's not up to legislation, nor is it up to adoptive families to make those sorts of controlling decisions for the lifetime for the lifetime of another person, you know, maybe from the time they're in your home until a certain age, there may be an appropriateness to that. But for the lifetime, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to be to be presented with a really strong, uh, a really strong scenario to be persuaded that at some point. A human being doesn't have the right to know that at some point all human beings have the right to know where they came from. Um, and I know it's Brian's birthday, but let me digress just a little bit and just say my mother is also an adoptee. Um, she is in her late 70s. She was adopted at a time when documents were forged and burned. So um, she's never been able to access any of her records. Um, and her birth certificate is completely fraud. Um, it's signed by a doctor that's, that's from a town that she wasn't even born in. She was born in a whole different state, brought to another state, and a birth certificate was forged by the doctor. I know adoptees that once they had their records, they found out that their birth date was, had been wrong. You know, they'd been celebrating a wrong date. I know people in foster care whose names were wrong. And so we're relying on these documents as if they're going to be true or information that we've had that we thought was true and we've acted on and it wasn't accurate or true. So what we think is like this nice, neat, clean, organized legal system, it's not. It's not because it's created by humans and we are fallible human beings. And so um, I feel like it is. I feel like it's really important. I feel like it's important for us to um, to stand on the side that says, yeah, people have a right to know where they come from. And we can love all the way through it all. It doesn't have to be a threat to our relationship with our children. It doesn't have to be about that. We have great big hearts. And we can love lots and lots of people. And so, um, happy birthday, Brian. <laughs> and if you've not already done so today, press pause on everything. Just press pause on it all. Anything you've been stressed out or worried about or teaching about or fussing about, just press pause and take a break. Give yourself five or ten minutes. And then go spend some time with your kids. Love on them. Love on those babies. Let them see the love you have from them. Let them see it from your eyes. Let them feel it from your energy. Let them see it in your facial expressions. Our subconscious communication is so powerful. And when they see how much we adore them, it changes so much. It changes so much. Sometimes when we've had those really tough days, to just literally go in and call time out. Just say, you know what? We've been fussing all day. I'm going to call time out. And I would love to hang out with you. Let's go get a Coke. Let's go get an ice cream. Let's go just take a break from it and relax and remember that we really do love each other. So in any given moment, we can act out of those blueprints of stress and fear and overwhelm. Or we can take one to two to three deep breaths and we can choose love. Much love to you guys. Have a blessed evening. We'll see you all on Monday.